We ask that you would just bless this portion to our minds and hearts this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for folks that lay down their lives and sacrifice and, and reveal Christ to us in such a beautiful way. It's all grace towards us. So we thank you for that. Bless these thoughts to us this morning. And uh, we think of anyone this morning that might be sick, that you'd touch them physically and, and heal them. Others who have needs, various situations that they're going through, Lord, we pray that you'd be with them and visit with them. We thank you. What a privilege it is to be a believer today and have the awesome rights, the privileges to go to Christ and to go to God and, and bring our requests. Let our requests be made known unto him. So we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Jeremiah 29.10, a verse that uh, often appears on wedding invitations. And some people try to squeeze it in on their engagement rings on the backs. But uh, it says, thus says the Lord. And uh, when they do put it on wedding invitations, they leave this first line out. After 70 years are completed in Babylon, <laughs> I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and uh, cause you to return to this place. It's the next verse. Uh, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's the verse, not that other one. But, um, so, I will visit you and perform my good word. Back up, back up in verse 10. I will perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place, speaking of Jerusalem. They had been taken away from Jerusalem and held captive for 70 years because of idolatry. But um, then, after the 70 years are complete, then is the time of visitation. And we love the time of visitation. The time of visitation is when the Lord visits. And when the Lord visits, it says, I will visit and then I will perform my good word. So when the Lord visits, there's a performance of his good word. And so all of us love that time. We want him to visit. Visit us on Sunday mornings in our service. Visit us in our prayer times. Visit us in our private devotions. Uh, visit us when we're studying the word at home alone. Visit us when we're listening to a CD or a tape. And uh, Visit us when we're reading a devotional. Re visit us, Lord. Visit and perform your good word in our lives. Uh, make a change, make a difference in us because you're visiting us. So the visit of God is a very important thing for God to visit the sick and they get healed, visit the depressed and they come out of it, uh, visit uh, all kinds of situations and the situation changes. We love the visiting of God, the, the visitation of God. The entire New Testament is called a visitation of grace and a visitation of, uh, of uh, the things that God had performed. So we love God visiting and uh, in performing the good word towards us and causing us to return to a place that we would otherwise not be able to get to on our own. He's, he's returning us to some place that we could not get there without his intervention. And so 70 years, we learn that. When we've been in 70 years, we've been in Babylon. Uh, the word Babylon means confusion. Uh, 70 years, we've been kind of confounded by our situations, confounded by where we're at, and uh, we can't do a thing to change it. No matter how hard we try, we can't do a thing about it. And it might be a personal problem. It could be anything in your life. And uh, so, but for 70 years, I'm stuck here, and I'm learning something while I'm here. I'm learning that, I can, that no matter what I do, I, it, it doesn't change. I can cry. I can scream. I can sing. I can, I can complain. I can do anything. It doesn't change. I can try all kinds of schemes and uh, ways to get out of it, but it doesn't change. What will change it is the visit of God. When God visits, then he performs, 
and then he causes. I will visit, I will perform, and then I will cause you to return. And so this is a work of God. And uh, I have adjusted to the fact, it took me 70 years to get here. I know I don't look that old yet, but it's coming soon. It took me 70 years to get there, and I've discovered something, I can't do it. God's got to do it. It's nice if you can learn that in 50 years, maybe 35. But uh, they, it, God gave them, he, 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 gave, he appointed them 70 years, and that's the lesson to learn, that you're not going to change a thing, uh, that what you, what you did with your life got you there, and you're not going to be able to change a thing without God removing you, taking you out. You need a visitation from God. In Luke 19... Uh, verses 41 through 44, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Remember the scene? He wept over Jerusalem because, he said, they missed the day of their visitation. He wept. He said, I would have gathered you up. I would have done so much for you. I would have been there for you. I could have helped, and you rejected me. The day of their visitation was rejected when they rejected Christ. And he would have performed his good word, and he would have caused them to return to their God in a fresh new way. He would have done it, but they rejected it. When he visits, we know in Luke 5.17, it says he was visiting, and the power to heal was present among them when he visited. So when the Lord visits, it's a beautiful thing. When two or three are gathered together in my name, He's in the midst. He's visiting. And so it's a special word that we, that's, that's used to indicate, of course, God is always present. He's always everywhere present. But it's a special word to use that God, that the Bible uses to, to indicate that he is making a, that he is, he's manifesting his presence at this particular time. He's always there, but now he's, this is a special moment between us and God. It's a visitation. And uh, we, we're grateful for that. So then he says, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. So I know the thoughts, God's thoughts towards his people, even though they failed, even though they did some pretty incredibly horrific things against the will of God. They found themselves in captivity to another nation, and God let them stay there. He appointed it for them to learn humility for 70 years. He says, my thoughts towards you are not thoughts of evil. I don't want revenge. I don't want to make you really pay for what you did. I don't want to harm you or hurt you. I have thoughts of peace towards you. And uh, those thoughts of peace, of course, we know we mean that we have peace with God. In Romans 5 and verse 1, when we uh, put our faith in him and we're justified, we are justified by faith and we have peace with God. We have, uh, there's no hostility, there's no anger, there's no retribution, there's no judgment aimed at us, there's peace. We have entered into a peaceful relationship with our Creator. And we entered into it uh, by His grace towards us and our faith in Him. And so that was peace with God. And then one step further, after we became Christians, then Philippians 4, 7, we ended up enjoying the peace of God on the inside of our lives. First, peace with God. Between me and God, we have peace. And uh, that peace is everlasting. It's never going to be broken. We have peace with God. And then on the inside of my life, as I'm growing and learning uh, the word of God and trusting his promises and going forward, as we said, Philippians 4, 7, in nothing be anxious, and don't stress out, don't stress out, just have peace on the inside, the peace of God, God's own peace uh, placed inside of us through the Holy Spirit. Remember the first three things What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, and peace. Peace on the inside, so that I can enjoy a peaceful existence here on earth while I'm, while I'm going through life. And there's plenty of things to be 
have unrest over, plenty of things to be anxious about in life, plenty of things to uh, uh, lose it and go, and go crazy and pull out my hair and everything else and throw a tantrum, but I have the peace of God. If it wasn't for that, if I didn't have that visitation going on on the inside, I would go crazy. But he, I have a visitation, and he is performing his good word, and he is causing me to go to this place called peace. And so I have peace with him, and that's a beautiful thing. So it would, uh, it would be easy for them to mistrust God. They've been praying for 70 years to get out of their situation. 70 years they've been praying, God, get us out of this, God. What's the, what's, why are we here? And for 70 years he has not answered them. He let them sit there. So it would be easy to mistrust God. You would think after 70 years they would throw their hands up and say, well, forget this. Well, the God's not even there. He doesn't even, he's, he doesn't even exist as, as far as I'm concerned. I've been praying 70 years. This prayer list is getting old. And, uh, and he's, he's, he hasn't answered me. And then, of course, uh, the truth of the matter is that God's love hasn't abandoned them. Yeah, for 70 years, he, he let it go. He didn't answer. But he was there. He was hearing. He knew where they were at. He knew that waiting on him for those 70 years would produce humility. He knew that humility was good for them because that would uh, open them up for a visitation of his, of his presence. And so he let them sit there and go through it. They didn't understand that. They just knew for 70 years he's ignored us. They didn't understand it, but love still was interested in Israel's best. Love had not abandoned, and love doesn't abandon. True love doesn't abandon. And so uh, they were still interested in Israel's, uh, the best for Israel, and God had not given up on them. The Christian has three great hopes this morning. The Christian... He has three great hopes. He hopes for salvation. We did that when we were, many times when we were first saved. And what a beautiful blessing it was to learn that we were secure in our salvation. That's a beautiful thing when you learn you're secure. Because that's one of our great hopes. You know, lots of times we do, when we talk to people, you say, well, do you know that you're saved? You know you're going to heaven when you die. Well, I hope to. I hope I'm going. That's a great hope that people have. Uh, but we can know, in 1 John 5.13, we can know by the words of this book, by the things that were written, by the, by the truths that were presented to us through the book, uh, we can know that we have eternal life. We can put that hope to rest. We can put that baby to bed. And we can, we can settle in on the fact that, yeah, I'm saved, and I know I'm saved. And that settles it. And I'm not, not going to go back on that ever again. Maybe some of us struggled with that in the early years of our Christianity. Maybe it was only a few months that you struggled with it, uh, but, uh, but perhaps it was a long time. But uh, then, we, then we settle in on the truth, and we end up in security and assurance in our hearts that indeed we have received what Christ has accomplished for us. We have that great hope of salvation, which is no longer wishful thinking. It is a secure hope. It is something that, it is our expectation of salvation. And then at the end, the third one, I'll go back to the second in a moment, but the third one is the hope of reward. When my life is all said and done, I hope that my life meant something. I hope that my life was meaningful. I hope that it impacted somebody. I hope that my children received something. I hope that somehow God used me in such a way that people were touched. I hope my life wasn't for nothing. I hope I didn't waste my life. People want to be significant. They want to feel that their life had some importance to it. And when we talk about rewards and we think about Matthew 25, 21, when people go to heaven and, and Jesus Christ says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Wow. 
My life meant something. It's well done, the Lord said to me. Well done. And uh, that means that my life has meant something. When, he, when, when Paul talks about rewards, and uh, that means that life had meaning to it. It means that my life was worth something. God is recognizing that he used me. It was all him. He used me and that my life had value to it beyond myself. My children, my husband, my wife, so forth. It had value. The one in the middle, the hope that's in the middle is the hope of life's details. You could, you could clump a whole bunch of them together, uh, all of the details of life for a whole lifetime, and you put them all together when it's Romans 8.28 that all things work together. We hope that all the time. I hope all this stuff works together. I hope it all comes out okay. I hope it all you know, plays, its, plays itself out and it all plays out to the glory of God. And so we have those great hopes that um, we live our lives with. Then in verse 12, back in uh, Jeremiah 29, then you will call upon me, he's telling them as they come out, as they put their hope and their trust in him to bring them out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem. After the 70 years are over, and it seemed like I didn't hear your prayer, but I heard you, but I had, uh, I had appointed the 70 years of waiting. So after that was over, then you will call upon me and go and, and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Then you will go after the 70 years are complete, and then you can pray, and then I will listen to you, meaning that I will take heed and I'll, take, and I'll answer you when you call upon me because the 70 years are complete and now the visitation is taking place and I'm bringing you back to Israel, back to Jerusalem and uh, the 70 years are over and when you pray now I will listen and uh, I will be true for God is not a man that he should lie says, nor the son of man that he should change his mind or repent. Has he said it and will not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. God is partnering with us. Verse 13 says this, and you will seek me at that time and you will find me. You will seek me. Time of visitation, the time of moving you out of Babylon and back to your homeland. And you will seek me during those, those months and those years, and I will be found of you. And he says, and when you search for me with all your heart, not half-heartedly, but with all your heart, you are after me, then you will find me. So all of these things are beautiful. We are all in this room strong advocates of Jesus Christ's salvation. We are all advocates of Christ plus nothing when we're talking about our salvation. It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. It's not Jesus Christ plus, well, brother, you've got to change your life. Sometimes they say you've got to change your life, then get saved. Uh, we are, not, we are not advocates of that. We are not advocates of uh, Christ saves you plus you must be baptized to be saved. Christ says they were in, um, uh, in, in the case of the New Testament in Acts chapter 15. It was uh, for the Jewish believer, it was uh, Christ saves you, yes, but you must be circumcised after that. If you're not, you're not saved. And that was a big debate they had in Acts chapter 15. And then it could be, well, Christ plus uh, some, certain, uh, some other type of ritual that I need to do. Christ plus a behavioral change. Christ plus, uh, and there's always something that they add to it. It says that not only do you need Jesus, but then you need something else that is attached to it in order for the salvation to be real. But we don't believe that. We never have. We believe that it's Christ plus nothing. Jesus Christ is sufficient and adequate to save us without us having to add a thing to it. We don't need to add a thing to it. 
What he did on the cross was complete, was entire, was perfect, and it satisfied God the Father's justice system completely. And when we go to Christ by faith, uh, we are saved totally because of what the, what the cross has accomplished and what the blood has done. And so it's Christ plus nothing, and you won't get us off that. We believe that with all of our hearts. We are, we are adamantly uh, signed on to that teaching. Jesus Christ plus nothing. So uh, we hear it all the time. We turn a radio on or talk to a brother in some other place or uh, watch a TV show and they're, and they're preaching uh, what they call the gospel, but they're adding things all the time. They're adding things. Even Christ plus tithing, which I struggled with for a while. But Christ, Christ, plus, Christ plus nothing is what we believe. Nothing. And anything we try to add to it is in Hebrews 6, treading the blood under our feet. The blood that sanctified us and separated us unto God, we're treading it under our feet. We're, we're, we're despising the cross of Christ because we're adding something to the gospel. So when a person's saved, they're saved. Uh, They may not look it for a while. They may not look like they're saved, act like they're saved, or even talk like they're saved for a while. But God is in them. If if they've called upon the Lord and they've put their trust in him, then God is in them. And God will bring them out of many things when he visits with them. He will perform his word, and he will cause them to move out and and to grow and to change. And we trust the Lord to do that. So, uh, so we are strong advocates of Christ plus nothing. But then when we move on and we discuss life's details, sometimes we think differently. So my salvation, Christ plus nothing. Jesus alone. It's all we needed. But then when it comes to my everyday life, living in this world, my joy, my peace, my capacity as a Christian, my happiness can sometimes depend on Christ plus a good job. In other words, I can be happy in Jesus, but I don't have a good job right now and I'm kind of down, kind of discouraged, kind of depressed, kind of, well, actually, I want to kill myself. I just can't take it anymore. I, have, I just can't go on like this. I have to have a job. And uh, maybe it's not the job. Maybe it's uh, Christ plus uh, making good money. Maybe it's Christ plus having my bills paid. As long as my bills are not paid, I cannot be happy. So then it becomes, for my life, my everyday life, Christ plus something. In order to have joy and peace and capacity and happiness in my life, then I have to add something to it. Perhaps it's uh, being out of debt. Perhaps it's a relationship I have to have. Or maybe it's a relationship I have to sever before I can be happy. Maybe it's having well-behaved kids, like so many of you guys have. Perhaps it's uh, good health. If I don't have good health, I can't be happy. And on and on it goes. There's always something that people can add to their walk with Christ. That means that I'm, I'm content with Jesus Christ, except or as long as this other thing falls into place. And if you remove the other thing, then Jesus is not enough to keep me smiling for very long. It's just not enough. I've got to have this other thing. And uh, many years ago, Pastor Stevens called that thing Adam's crutch. The crutch. That Adam has to have something to hold him up or he'll fall down. And he always sees something out there that makes him want to, uh, that he sees that he can't get along, he can't walk unless he has it. So it goes beyond having Jesus alone to fulfill their lives. They've got to have Jesus plus this thing. 
Remember Psalm 127 when the children of Israel were asked by their captors to sing a song in a strange land and they said, we can't sing. We can't sing. We, in fact, we, we, all of our guitars, we hung them on the tree behind us. We're not singing. We're not playing. We can't do it. We're not happy. There's no mirth in us. There's no joy in us. There's nothing in us. We are, we are, we are exasperated. The joy of our salvation is gone because we're in a strange land. We're not home. We've been dragged from our homes and we've been taken 900 miles away and we are not happy about it. So don't tell us to sing a song. Forget it. So they had a Christ plus I got to be home in order to be happy. And they put the old guitars on the willow tree. Back then it was uh, not guitars, it was uh, harps. They could play them here, they didn't have to wait for heaven. And these things are not unreasonable requests, these things that people need in their life, that, um, that they're focused on. They're not an unreasonable request. God wants you to have those things, most of them. And so they're not unreasonable requests. What he doesn't want is us to look at those things as the necessity of my life. Where I cannot, I am completely and altogether going to be very unhappy if I don't get there, if I don't have that, if I don't reach that goal. I'm just not going to be happy. I'm not going to be joyful. I'm not going to have a capacity to continue as a Christian without that. And when I'm like that, I'm very vulnerable to temptation. That's when the devil can come in and tempt you uh, with that, with the, tempting you with that thing that you need in your life besides Christ and draw you away from the Lord. And so that's why for our own protection, the Lord wants us to put him first and keep him first always in all things. And he knows we need a job, and he knows we need to pay our bills, and he knows we need relationships, where that's what people are all about. He knows we need all of these things, and he also wants to be the provider of those things. So instead of Jesus plus the thing, it's Jesus who is my provider who will give me all these things through him and with him. And so I don't have to separate the two and thinking, I got Christ, but I also have this need for this thing here. And I can tell if I'm doing that because I become unhappy and stay unhappy for a while. It's, not, it's normal to, to be unhappy at first when the bills show up in the mail and so forth. But, but you adjust. You, you look at your situation, and then you adjust. You say, okay, um, I'm, I'm not going to let this take me down because I have the Lord, and I'm trusting him. And you build yourself up on who Christ is in your life, and not what the fact that you don't have something, you're missing something. And, uh, and, and then, uh, he, the one you're building yourself up on, is your provider who will provide for you all of these things. That's why he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to your life. Seek first the kingdom, who is, who is Christ, put Jesus Christ first, Colossians 1.19, giving him the preeminence in all things, and then all these other things that are needful in life and that God wants to bless us in life. In uh, 1 Timothy 6.17, he wants to bless us with all things. He wants to bless us and, and, have us and have us enjoy the things of life, but he wants us to get them at seeing him as the provider and, and then... He blesses us with those things, and we don't separate the thing from the Lord. Because if we do, then I'm vulnerable to being tempted and drawn away. And I can tell I'm getting that way because I've just gone through two weeks of depression because I don't have something. And I'm miserable and I'm mopey and I'm, I, have, I haven't looked up in days. All I've seen is my shoes, which are very big. And that's all I can look at is down, and I'm just, you know, you tell me a joke, I can't laugh. Uh, and I'm like that for a long period of time because I'm focused on something other than Christ. It's the early warning system. 
I'm focused on something other than Jesus Christ, and it's Adam's crutch. I can't go on without it. So Paul says in Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. So what is Paul saying? He says, I've learned to be content. Even when I don't have all the things that I desire to have in my life, I've learned to be very content and keep myself focused on Jesus Christ. He's my provider. He's my portion. And I'm going to be focused on him. And if I don't have the other things that I would like to have, I'll just be content in him and enjoy him and know that I'm in a place of waiting and some and soon he will come through and give me what I need. But I don't have to be so hung up on the thing that it takes me out of joy, out of happiness, and out of my contentment. He says, I know how to get along, in verse 12, with humble means. Probably a few of us know how to get along with humble means. And I also know how to live in prosperity. Not so many. But in, any, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and of suffering need. So he went through as an apostle, as a man of faith, as a guy who uh, God used to perform great miracles, as somebody who uh, would send his handkerchief across town and somebody would get healed, a very mighty man of God. Still, he had times when he didn't have enough money. He had times when he didn't have the proper uh, housing for himself, he had times when he didn't have enough food. He had times of, of, of need in his life, times when he didn't have what he needed. And yet he learned it during those times not to be all focused on what he didn't have, but to be focused on Christ and experience contentment and relaxation and not stressing out and not getting all down and discouraged and just keep his eyes on the Lord, knowing and believing that God would provide. Whatever the situation is, God would provide it. And uh, he was exercising himself in faith. And he concludes it by saying, I can do all things through Christ, who, through him who strengthens me. I can go through this. Uh, this. I have some needs. They're real. God knows them. But I'm not going to get hung up on my needs. I'm going to be uh, focused on the one who was hung up for me on the cross. And I'll stay fixed on him. And I know that I can go through all these things. I can endure all things, literally it says, through him who strengthens me. I can go through it. I can go through it. Whatever it is. And then, of course, in the same chapter, we get down to verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So this is, I'm content. I'm, con I'm happy. I'm relaxed. I have needs. I have some things that I'm missing in my life, but I'm not focused on them. I'm focused on Christ. In verse 19, God will take care of it. God will provide it. God will be the one that will come through for me. Paul and Silas acted that way. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were, who were arrested for disrupting a very lucrative psychic network. Very lucrative. And they got arrested. They messed with the psychics. They were beaten with rods. They were locked down in the stocks in the deepest part of the prison. And they were to, um, made to sit there. The stocks were on the floor and they would lock their ankles in them and they had to sit on the floor uh, we don't know how long, perhaps days, perhaps weeks, sit on the floor. There were no bathroom breaks. And uh, there was no comfort. There was nothing to be in that situation. There was nothing to be happy about. And uh, you can imagine the scene. And the rats, the bugs, and the smell, and everything else. You can imagine how horrible it was. But at midnight, this man who learn to be content in whatever condition state he found himself, and his 
uh, and his uh, associate, Silas, were praying and singing hymns to God. They were praying, and then they, after they prayed a little bit, they started to sing. Ran out of things to pray about. What am I going to pray for now? I don't know. Let's just sing. So they start singing. And uh, there they were in that uh, horrid condition and position, uh, the most uncomfortable you could possibly imagine, uh, in desperate need of chiropractic care by now. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was brutal. And they were there, and they were praying, and then they were singing. And all the other prisoners were listening to them. So while they're singing, they're ministering. The other prisoners are listening. Imagine what they thought. These guys have lost their minds. What's up with these guys? Suddenly in verse 26, there was a great earthquake. We've had a lot of those around lately. There was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately the doors were open and everybody's chains were loosed. That's quite a shaking prison. Doors flying open, chains falling off, and uh, they were set free. Verse 27, the guards, the keeper of the prison, awoke from his sleep, I would hope so, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, like any, any normal prisoner would do when the doors fly open, the chains fall off, you get out of town. Uh, so supposing that he had lost his prisoners, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he was responsible for those prisoners with his own life. That was to ensure there was no sloppy care of the prisoners. That if you lost the prisoner, you forfeited your own life. But Paul called out in verse 28 with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm. We're all here. We're all here. The foundations were shaken. The chains fell off. The doors flew open. But we're not escaping the situation. It is not, it, it is not so horrible for us that we're, as soon as we see a crack of light in the door, we're bolting for freedom. It's not that horrible for us. We were, in fact, singing. We were, in fact, rejoicing and actually having a little fun sitting here in this horrid stocks, hands and feet bound, sitting in our own uh, whatever, and, uh, and uh, being in this condition. We were actually starting to have a little fun singing to the Lord. Silas is a little off-key, but uh, we were having fun, and my voice is a little squeaky, uh, so it says in church his, his history. But we were having fun. We didn't want to escape the problem. We're here, and we'll, so let's just see what God's going to do. I'm thinking visitation. I'm thinking the Lord's visiting uh, when the earth shakes and doors fly open, chains fall off. The result of prayer and worship, praising him, I, I'm, I'm thinking of visitation. Wonder what God's going to do. So don't, 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 don't cut your own throat off here. Don't, don't stab yourself with your own sword. We're all right here. Not, we didn't go anywhere. We're here. And that, of course... More than, the, more than the earthquake and more than the way things went down, the doors flying open and all of that, to know that they were still there affected this jailer tremendously. You didn't run. You didn't escape. You were content in the midst of this. So he called for a light, called for a lamp, a, a lamp, and he ran in and he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. What a visitation is taking place. He gets a lamp, he runs in, doesn't have to unlock the door, the door's wide open, runs in and falls down, and they're already on the ground. And you know the condition of the cell, and he falls down and he's trembling before 
before these two men of God. And then it says in verse 30, he brought them out. He, un- he unhooked them. He would got them out of the stocks. He took, and, uh, if, if they already weren't, they, I mean, they already were unhooked. But uh, he, he helped them get up and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I do to be saved? This is real. I've, just, I've witnessed something today, and more than just the earthquake, I've witnessed men who didn't run but stayed, and there was a visitation of God here, and I've been touched, and I want to be saved. I want what you have. Because my trial was, come, my trial was if you had run and escaped, I would have had to kill myself. But you guys, Paul and Silas found joy and peace and happiness and a capacity for life because their philosophy was Jesus plus nothing, not just for salvation, but in the details of their life. We can handle whatever, we can endure all things through Christ who strengthens us. We can go through any trial, uh, it's not any, anything that hits us, any disease, any problem, any, any, any loss in our life, it's not going to be fun. Nobody says it'll be fun. You have to smile through it. It's, but, but we will endure through it. And our testimony will be we won't run from it. Escape won't be the only thing on our mind. God will be on our mind. Because we are very different people. And so uh, we have this amazing thing Freedom from prison will not be Adam's crutch for Paul and Silas. It will not be, Lord, I can be happy, but I've got to be out of this jailhouse. Lord, I'll do your will, but these three things have to happen first. Lord, I'll follow you, but first I've got to go and bury somebody and take care of my business here and there and do those things first. Or I just, I'll just won't be able to do it. I won't. I won't have peace if I don't do that. And so Paul and Silas' freedom wasn't the issue. He said, Silas, let's just pray, sing some songs, enjoy where we're at, get our minds off our situation, put them on the Lord, live for Christ. He knows we're here. We may be in the deepest, darkest part of the prison. God sees us very clearly. And he's our provider. He'll take care of us. He'll do what, whatever, we, whatever needs to be done. If we need to be here, then we're here. We're not going to do anything we do. is not going to change it anyway. And if it's for time for us to leave, God will, God will spring the doors open and we'll be out of here. But let's just look at the Lord. Let's just focus on him. And know that whatever happens in our lives, it's Jesus Christ plus nothing. Salvation, details of life, right to the day we die, it's Christ plus nothing else. And of course, David, the Lord's my shepherd. That's all I need. That's all I want. Don't need anything beyond that. And if I do, God will provide it. He's my provider. He's my portion. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We love you. We praise you. We worship you that we have a God who undertakes all of our care. In every detail of our life, he undertakes our care. He is the the much more caring God, and uh, we're so grateful for that. We know that whatever, whatever the situation, the need, or whatever, Lord, that you have it in your hands. And... uh, We want to be able to sing in a strange land. We want to be able to sing when things aren't right, when things aren't, when things are not going right, when things are are not um, going, uh, when there's pressures, when there's adversity, when there's obstacles. And uh, like Pastor Jeff mentioned on Friday night, grace, grace to the mountain. We want to be able to sing and praise you through those times. So we love you this morning. We thank you. If there's anyone here you've never received Christ as your Savior, 
just want you to put your hand up with me right now. I'm, I'm receiving Christ as my Savior. I'm trusting in you, Lord, this morning. I'm believing in you. I'm trusting in you. I put my faith in you. It's not the hand that does it. It's your heart that does it. But uh, I trust you. I believe you. I put my tr faith in you. And I, I want to go to heaven when I die. And I'm asking you in Christ's name. And that's the, mo the most important decision you'll make in your life. And a hundred years from now, you'll be ever so grateful that you made it. Uh, more grateful than you'll ever, ever know in this, in this time. But uh, it'll be so good. Father, bless the uh, fellowship. Bless the baby shower after. And um, bless the offering now before we end the closing song. In Christ's name, amen.